Dan uh, called me and we were talking about this, this conference and he asked if I would speak and I said, sure. He said, what are you thinking about having me talk about? And he said, well, why don't, you, uh, why don't you do the bondage of the will since, since that's your thing? I said, sure, absolutely, I'll do the bondage of the will, no problem. And then I come and as I usually do, uh, I thought, oh, I'll be in a little corner room somewhere, and I'll just show up and I'll riff so I don't have to prepare. Uh, I've been reading The Bondage of the Will and studying it uh, for about 18 years now. And uh, then yesterday morning he comes up and he says, uh, you're in the main ballroom now for your breakaway. I said, oh, uh, why is that? And he said, because you're the most registrants of any breakaway. And I said, holy shit, why didn't you tell me six months ago? I would have prepared. <laughs> to which Scott Key said, no, you wouldn't have. And I said, that's true. I wouldn't have. <laughs> but I would have thought very seriously about what I was going to say. But that's the thing about the bondage of the will is that, as Luther famously said, it's, it was, he considered his greatest work. And yet, even as it was published, his own colleagues were confused by it. Some were upset by it. Some didn't understand uh, the tone of his response to Erasmus of Rotterdam, the prince of the humanists, as he was called. And then, in, in the history of the Lutheran church anyways, to the present tense, the bondage of the will isn't that popular. It's not widely read. It's, and the reason is it's a very difficult text to read. It's very dense. It's very complicated. It's very nuanced. And the reason is that uh, Erasmus and Martin Luther followed a late medieval form of debate. And what that means is they, Erasmus wrote his text, his book on, on the freedom of the will, so to speak, in response to a lot of pressure he was receiving, both from the papacy, from cardinals, from Henry VIII, uh, from university faculties that he served on, to separate himself from Martin Luther and the reformers to establish essentially that he was a faithful Roman Catholic and not a part of this Saxon Reformation that was happening. Because early on, uh, Luther and his colleagues at Wittenberg, for example, were lumped in with these humanists that Erasmus was kind of a de facto leader of. And there were many different movements of humanism, but Erasmus was really the most popular of the humanists. And to sum up, humanism is essentially what it sounds like, which is, what is our human potential? What is um, the possibilities for the human being? And the way that this movement worked is that they went back and they recovered the primary text. And they were concerned with reading the primary text in the original languages and rediscovering history and literature and art and music in a way to get back to the truth. And so for this humanist movement, um, the famous saying is ad fontes, to the source. And this was highly influential then on Luther and his colleagues because uh, as was mentioned yesterday, I think by Scott in his Melanchthon lecture, uh, Reuchlin published what was really the first Hebrew primer that was widely published in 1505. Before that, you had to track down a rabbi if you wanted to learn Hebrew. And so this movement, and then along with the invention of the printing press in the previous generation, really allowed people like Martin Luther to get back to the original source text, to read the primary texts, which of course kickstarted the Reformation because if you can read the Bible in the original languages, you can then begin to critically address the text of the scriptures, but also then address theology and dogma that is attempting to interpret, so they say, the scriptures. So Erasmus is backed into this corner and he's essentially forced to write something to prove his fidelity to the papacy that Henry VIII, you know, Erasmus was friends with Sir Thomas More who was Henry VIII's counselor until he pissed off Henry and Henry had him executed. So Erasmus had a lot of people putting pressure on him to separate himself from the reformers. And so Erasmus thought he had picked the perfect topic to write on. It was completely innocuous. It was, it was of no threat to anybody whatsoever. It was an academic argument, he thought. And he wrote it in Latin so that only academics could read it. And the topic he chose, the doctrine he chose, is the doctrine of the free will. And whether or not we have a free will, whether Christians have a free will. And so he writes on the freedom of the will, and he discusses uh, what the will is capable of with and without the help of God's grace how to read the Bible, uh, which in Erasmus's way of thinking is not something any of you should do, let the church read the Bible for you, um, because, well, you're essentially as low as pigs as far as intelligence goes. And he publishes it, it gets back to Luther, 
Philip Melanchthon was a, a friend and, and considered uh, Erasmus one of his mentors. And the expectation was then that, that Luther would respond to this text by Erasmus. And Luther didn't want to, because he was busy. And Melanchthon kept promising and assuring people that Luther would write a response to Erasmus's attacks on him and his teachings on the matter of the will. And Luther kept not writing a response. And so finally, Melanchthon and some of his colleagues at the fac on the faculty in Wittenberg did what any of you would do if one of your friends won't do what you want them to. Uh, they went to Luther's wife and said, can you talk to him? <laughs> and so they bothered Katie, and they were newly married. This is 1525. They were new, like, the ink wasn't even dry on the marriage contract yet. And so finally Katie just goes to Martin and says, would you write the damn thing so that they leave me alone? So it, Luther sits down to write his response to Erasmus. It takes him about three months altogether. He publishes it, and that was supposedly going to be the end of it. Uh, unfortunately, Luther wrote his response to Erasmus in both Latin and German so everybody could read it. And Luther says in, in, in his response to Erasmus, uh, you've actually hit uh, the key matter in all of Christian doctrine. You've actually written on the hinge on which everything turns. And to sum up the historical part for you, when Luther published it, not only were some of his colleagues puzzled, and Melanchthon was, was deeply distressed by the tone of Luther's response, but Erasmus was so hurt by Luther's response that he wrote an 800-page response to Luther's response, to which I only know two people in church history that have ever actually read it all the way through. And because really, no. Um, <laughs> And so this is what I mean about this, the, the type of debate and, and why it's so dense and why it's so difficult to get into even to this day. Erasmus wrote in Latin, it's on, on God or on scripture and on God and on our willing and on Jesus. So Luther, when he writes his response to Erasmus, he responds to Erasmus point by point. So the first section then of Luther's is on scripture. Is scripture confusing and ambiguous, as Erasmus says, or is it clear? Then on the matter of God, who is God? Who, is, who isn't God? Then on the matter of our willing, do we have a free will? Do we not have a free will? And then lastly, who is Jesus and what does he have to do with the rest of it? Now, it's so easy then to get lost in the woods of the argument because if you're not reading Erasmus's original text, alongside Luther's response to him, all you're getting is one side of the argument. And so it's very, it's, again, it's like only, it's like watching a movie and the two actors are in the scene, but only one actor's voice is audible and you can only see the other actor's voice or lips moving. How are you supposed to understand what they're talking about? You're only getting half the conversation. So what I'm gonna do, hopefully, shortly, is to, in 40 minutes, summarize the most complicated debate in church history uh, in such a way that not only do you understand what it's about, but that you want to go read it for yourself. <laughs> or I could just pee myself and we could call it a day. Um, <laughs> scene. Um, so I'll begin with a question then, and what I want to do is not go through the bondage of the will point by point and break it down for you, because to be honest, that's as boring as hell, and I don't even want to do that. Um, but rather, I'm going to go through the argument in a way that I hope engages you, it excites you, it stirs up your imagination, and it causes you to want to go read it for yourself. Because I really think that's the best way for me to address this for you in the time that I have. And also, if you want to, side plug, uh, a couple months ago I did a podcast with the Thinking Fellows, and we did a 15-minute short that was just me talking about how to read The Bondage of the Will in 15 minutes. So if you get nothing from this, Go listen to the Thinking Fellows podcast where I talk about the bondage of the will. So first question then to get us into this conversation is, what does God's wrath feel like according to the Bible? What does God's wrath feel like according to the Bible? Well, according to the Apostle Paul, it feels like free will. God's wrath feels like free will. Romans chapter 1, God gave them over to the desires of their heart. Three times, God gave them over to the desires of the heart. God gave them over to the desires of the heart. And as the prophet Jeremiah says, when you worship nothing, you become nothing. 
That is, in the Old Testament way of seeing things, whatever you worship, if you worship the living God, you have life. If you worship dead gods, you become death. You become Havel of Havels. You become nothing, a breath, transitory. And so from the very beginning, the Bible lays out for us that the wrath of God is, oh, you want to worship sex, drugs, and rock and roll? You can have it. And that, at least for me as a pastor and as a theologian, is so much more terrifying than the thought that God is like Zeus or Odin who will cast down lightning bolts upon us if we step out of line. Because according to Paul, when God gives us over to the desires of our heart, we actually believe that God has given us the free will to choose between right and wrong, the good and the bad. And so the people that are going into hell aren't being thrown into hell. They're sprinting into hell laughing and singing, singing joyously because they believe they are serving God's will. So then when we get into the debate between Erasmus and Luther, and Erasmus historically has always been seen as the optimistic one, the theologian of grace, the defender of freedom, and Luther's the negative one, and he's harsh in his criticism of Erasmus' argument, and he's a real Debbie Downer when it comes to human potential. But it's actually the complete opposite. So the bondage of the will, what does this mean then as we dig into this, this dense argument? What is the bondage of the will or the captivation of the will or the will that is captive. What does that mean? Does that mean that I can't even choose to put my pants on in the morning if God doesn't like pick my legs up? Uh, some days I pray that that were true. Um, no, what it means is this. What our heart wants, our mind always justifies. To have a bound will means that what our heart wants our mind justifies. And there is never a moment when your heart doesn't want something. So therefore, there's never a moment when your mind isn't justifying what your heart wants. It may be as simple as just wanting to breathe clearly. I'm in jujitsu on Thursday morning, and the humidity out here is killing me. And I'm just praying, God, please let me breathe so I can go five more minutes. On the other hand, I want to serve and love God. I want to obey his good and holy law. I want to love my neighbors myself. <clears throat> and yet, my will is captive. In relation to God, I have no choice. In relation to you, I have some choice. But in relation to God, I have no choice. My will is bound. So what is my will bound? What is my wanting? What is my choosing bound to want? As Luther famously said, sin and resistance, that the only thing that you or I contribute to our salvation in the end is sin and resistance. That's what it means to have a bound will, a will that is in bondage to sin, death, and the devil. So the heart always wants something, and our mind is always justifying what the heart wants. And so our choosing and our wanting in relation to God is captive to sin, death, and the devil. But in relation to God saving work for us at Golgotha, we always always choose sin and resistance. So that's why for Dr. Luther, God's way of being God for you is the only solution to the problem of human freedom. That the father sent his son to save us from a free will. So that God's solution to the problem of our free will is in fact to set us free in Christ. But Erasmus, in his argument on what we can and what we can't choose in relation to God, what we can and can't choose in relation to each other, but primarily in relation to God and our salvation. He begins arguing for the possibilities of the human will that's helped along by God's grace with beginning in the law. Because for Erasmus, and for the humanists in general, but for Erasmus in particular here, the ultimate purpose of our life as Christians is to become better moral people that the ultimate goal of God's grace active and working in us, the grace that pulls us up the ladder towards salvation, towards the throne of Christ, that ultimately we are to go from bad to good, good to better, and better to best. Let your good be better and your better be best. In fact, Erasmus has been called by historians of this the proto-evangelical, that Erasmus is the proto-American evangelical Christian, that with the help of God's grace, I can progress towards God's throne. And so for Erasmus, that's the point, is to get better, to behave yourself. And so, of course, he starts then where? In the law. 
And what Erasmus hears when he reads the commandments, what he hears when he hears God speaking the word of the law in Deuteronomy or Jesus giving the Beatitudes, what he hears is when God commands something, he must have given us the ability to obey. God commands something, he must have given us the ability, because why would God command the impossible? So, for example, Erasmus uses the, the example of Jacob and Esau. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Obviously, Esau did something that would cause God to hate him to say that because otherwise God would not be just and righteous because that would be an unjust, unrighteous thing to hate Esau for no reason whatsoever. Or God hardened Pharaoh's heart where Erasmus argues, well, wait a minute. What that means is God, Pharaoh hardened his heart already and therefore God hardened Pharaoh's hardened heart, which is why God is just when he hardens Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So for Erasmus, that's the point. He starts in the law because the commands point us in the direction of how we are supposed to behave, how we are supposed to become more godly, how we are supposed to advance toward righteousness because God has given us the ability to keep the law. Now, it doesn't say that God has given us the ability to keep the law, but Erasmus infers this. And this is the key point is that for, for Erasmus, the Bible is confusing and ambiguous. And so uh, Erasmus uses what's, what we would call a word study method of Bible study. And what that means is Erasmus picks a topic like, say, free will, and then he searches the Old and New Testaments for all the examples, excuse me, that he thinks prove free will. And he writes them all down on the left-hand side of the paper. And then he goes through the Bible, and he finds every example in the Bible that disproves free will, and he writes those on the right-hand side. And the left-hand side, he believes, that proves that we have free will is longer than the list on the right-hand side that says we don't, and therefore we must have free will. And of those that seem to disprove free will, Erasmus says, well, that's just because it's confusing and ambiguous, and we just need to figure it out. And so Erasmus, again, as a proto-evangelical, is really big on topical sermons, and also then asking, what do you think this means? What do you think it means when God says, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated? Luther, in his response to this, argues that God commands what he commands for the specific purpose that he doesn't want us to do what he commands. But rather, he commands the impossible because he wants to bring us up short. He wants to shut us up. He wants to stop us dead in our tracks and reveal to us that we have no freedom to choose or not choose his way of salvation. That God commands the impossible and that we have no ability to obey God's commands on our own not even with the help of God's grace can we obey his commands, but rather God gives his 10 commands in order to stop us and to say to us, shut the hell up and let me do my work of saving you from yourself. So for example then, to quote Luther, if thou art willing, it's a verb in the subjunctive mood. Stay with me, I promise we'll, we'll go to Moria, I'll bring you right back to the Shire, I swear. If thou art willing is a verb in the subjunctive mood, the woulda, shoulda, couldas. But for Luther, if asserts nothing. It's a conditional statement. It doesn't say anything in fact. If thou art willing, if thou here, if all the King James people, you appreciate that? If thou art willing, if thou art here, if thou do, they don't tell us what we are capable of doing. They don't tell us about what we are able to do. They just tell us what we are bound to do or face the consequences, judgment, condemnation, wrath. Then Luther says the commandments are not given inappropriately. God doesn't command pointlessly, but in order that through the commands, <clears throat> the proud and the blind man may learn the plague of his own impotence, his own powerlessness, should he try to do what is commanded. We are not that far into this, brothers and sisters, and you can already tell why this is offensive. The commandments are not given pointlessly, but they are given in order so that the proud blind man may learn the plague of his own powerlessness should he try to do what the law commands. And then he says, the passages of scripture that you cite, Erasmus, they're imperatives, they're commands, they're demands, and they prove and they establish nothing about your ability, but only lay down what is and what is not to be done. 
So then he says, even grammarians and schoolboys on street corners know that nothing more is signified by verbs in the imperative mood than what ought to be done, which when you come to think about it, must have been really interesting in Wittenberg at the time to be walking down the sidewalk and run into a pack of, of, of boys that have been expelled from grammar school. We'll call them the Latin kings. And <laughs> A-S-A, that's a subjunctive, not an imperative. Oy. No. But that even schoolboys know the difference between a subjunctive and an imperative, Erasmus. And that what is done or can be done should be expressed by words in the indicative. They should be statements of fact, not what you should or shouldn't do, but what you can and can't do. How is it that you theologians are twice as stupid as schoolboys? <laughs> How to win friends and influence people. Which is why I have to come here, because I have no friends. <laughs> because I've been reading this for 18 years, in that as soon as you get a hold of a single imperative verb, you get a hold of one demand, one command, you infer that it's a fact, that I can do what it commands, as though the moment a thing is commanded, it's done or that it can be done. So he says, Erasmus, you and your folks, you're so stupid. Even schoolboys know this stuff. See, Erasmus, when he reads the Bible, when he reads commands, when he reads the law, he infers he asks, what does God really mean when he commands that I should have no other gods? What does he mean when he says that I should honor my mother and father? What does he mean by that? And that from that, Erasmus believes then he can understand who God is and what the purpose of the law is in relation to our willing, our choosing, our doing. And of course, like I said, for Erasmus, the purpose of all this is so that we can move from our vices toward the theological virtues of faith, love, and wiping your mouth off with a napkin when you're done eating dinner. Luther, on the other hand, points out to Erasmus that what he has missed altogether then by working this way through the law is that the Holy Spirit is out electing sinners apart from the law through Jesus Christ. And so that in the end, by asking what does the law mean and assuming that we have the ability to obey the commands when they come to us, Erasmus has no place theologically for the work of the Spirit electing sinners in Jesus Christ apart from the law. And this is the heart of the argument in the bondage of the will. This is the heart of Luther's argument. The work of theology, the work of the theologian, the task of Christian preaching. And so the foundation of all pastoral care is not asking what does this mean for our possibilities as Christians, not asking what does this mean for our limitations, what possibilities does the law open up for us, but that the work of theology, the task of the Christian preacher, the foundation of pastoral care is preach Christ. What is the Father doing through the Son is the question. How is the Father reconciling the world to himself through the Son is the question. Luther recognizes that if the Father sends the Son to save us, then it's not the law that sets us free. It's Christ. And therefore, Christ is not a new Moses, but rather he is the one who throws the last shovel full of dirt on Moses' grave. Preach Christ crucified. That, for Dr. Luther, is God's desired way of being God for you unconditionally. Not working through the law in such a way that he says, all right, I think if you, if you really work at it, if you work out, you eat right, you sleep right, I think by this time next year we can put on 20 pounds of muscle, we can improve your 40 speed by at least eight-tenths of a second, and I'm positive we can really nail that sixth commandment next year. But for Luther, this is the point. What Erasmus misses is that only a preacher who assumes the bondage of the will for the people that they're preaching to truly comes to set the captives free. This is the key point, brothers and sisters. If you assume that you have the possibility, the ability to do what God's command, your job as the preacher, your job as the theologian is to, well, fix your hearer's behavior to help them become better Christians, because you assume they can actually do what is commanded, whereas Luther says, no, we assume that your will is bound, that you cannot do what the law commands, and therefore we have come to set you free because you are captive to sin and death on that account, because the wages of sin are death. 
And sin uses the commands as an opportunity to enslave me, to increase sin beyond all measurement. So who's going to deliver me from this body of death? According to St. Paul, it's only the Holy Spirit that does that. So then Luther continues the cute stories that take over as the primary purpose of the sermon, personal anecdotes, personal experiences of the preacher or the congregation or other Christians, the saints' examples, the example of even Jesus. They tear down the preaching office. They tear down theology brick by brick, and they lead us to finally where Erasmus' argument is. Theology by inference. Theology by, well, what do you think this means? And then the assumption that we actually have the power and the ability to do it to act on it. Theology by analogy. Theology by symbolism. God's will, not where he wants to be preached, revealed, and worshipped, but where he doesn't want to be preached, revealed, and worshipped. Instead of going to the cross, where he is preached, revealed, and worshipped, where God reveals his, his will for us, where he reveals his glory to us, we dig around in the desert. And we ask, have we done enough yet, God? Have we done too much? And then the pastor becomes like a race car driver. You come into his office and you say, Pastor, I volunteered at church three times a week. I give 10% last year, 50% this year of everything that I've earned. I have been the Sunday school director for 12 years. Everything that I do is centered around the church. And then I as pastor say, Mary, you've done so much. It's time for you to take a break and relax. Let somebody else do it for a little while, then come back. On the other hand, John comes into my office and John just got a rehab for the third time, and he's probably going to jail again. His wife is divorced. He's estranged from his children. He can't hold down a job for longer than three months. Nobody really wants him in church because he bothers other people with his smell and the way he looks and the impertinent questions he's always asking. And so I say, John, you're a sinner, and you need to clean your life up. You need to recommit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to get sober. You need to repent of the evil that you've done, and then come back to church when you've proven that you're truly contrite, when you're truly repentant. Push down on the gas pedal for more, let off on the gas for less. But that's not where God wants to be known as God for you at. God wants to be known as a God for you in Jesus Christ. So for Luther, the only way to overcome the problem of God hidden, where he doesn't want to be known, that is in the whirlwind, in the smoke and the thunder and the lightning of Sinai, The only way to overcome the problem of God hidden is to locate where God is preached, revealed, and worshipped, where God is God for you, Calvary much. Christ crucified draws all things to himself. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And as Dr. Luther concludes, take the saying of Christ in John, no one comes to me unless my father draws him. So what does this leave a free choice then? If no one can come to me unless my father draws him to me, what does this leave for your free choice? So one of the few scholars in the 20th century who actually cared enough about the bondage of the will to write about it wrote, Luther's work at the bondage of the will is concerned about salvation only. Luther asked radically and exclusively for God alone and God's will. That is that the God for us and the gospel exclusively. Solus Christus, Christ alone, is carried by Luther almost to the extreme in the bondage of the will. Since Luther declares that all humankind is in need of salvation without qualification, without limits, without conditions. So then in the preaching of Christ crucified, Luther understands that the law has reached its terminus, its end. That it is hung on Jesus, put to death. And in place of the law's demand, Christ stands before us raised from the dead. Because as Dr. Luther says, to will the law and to will the gospel, to choose law and gospel, to not choose sin and to choose death belongs to the divine power alone, as Paul says, in more than one place. See, Erasmus' like, primary premise, his thesis is the fundamental problem for Luther, which is why Dr. Luther says, as I, I said earlier, that he, he responds to Erasmus, you've hit it on the head. You've nailed the primary matter of the Christian faith, this matter of can we or can't we will to obey the commands of God and therefore participate in our own salvation. For Erasmus, in the freedom of the will, the will always is in neutral gear. You know, as a side note, where did all the the stick shifts go? When did that happen? We have nerfed the world 
You can't just pop the clutch in the wintertime in Minnesota anymore. You have to call for somebody to come and give you a jump. So Erasmus just assumes that we're all in neutral gear, just like in an automobile being shifted this way and that way at will. So again, like I said, as a pastor, if, you're not doing, if I don't feel you're doing enough, we got to shift up. If I feel you're doing too much, we got to shift down. And that that's really the rule of the priesthood. That's really the role of the church in the late medieval, in late medieval Catholicism. That's the role of the priest in this penitential system is to let you know where you stand in relation to your sin and your vice and where you stand in relation to Jesus. But you realize very quickly, as they did, the tension in all that. Because if you're standing there and your priest is saying to you, do a little bit more, do a little bit less, you don't know how far away from your sin you are, and you don't know how close to Jesus you are, and you're constantly caught in this tension between the two, always worrying that you're going to backslide into your sin and vice, and never quite knowing if you climbed up the ladder far enough to get in at the last day. So like I say to my own people, some Sunday for fun, we should all stand up individually and confess our sins before the congregation, to which every sphincter puckers, and then I say, (laughs) but if I go first, it'd be okay, right? And everyone's like, well, yeah, I, I guess, because I'm the religious dude. And so if I stand up and I confess my sins, I'm an alcoholic and I'm a bad husband and I'm kind of a crappy father and all these other things, well, then I've set the bar. That's like an A-plus confession. (laughs) And then we'll have the elders go next. And the elders of the church, they'll stand up individually and give their confessions. And of course, the elders, being elders, they don't want to make an A-plus confession because you don't want to, you know, pastor. And so they'll give like a a B-plus, A-minus confession And maybe if they're having a bad week, maybe a a C plus at best. But the point is, is that everybody can stand up and make their confession so long as Sally over in there in the corner goes last because we know she's the most sinful person in this congregation. So as long as I'm not as righteous as the pastor and not as bad as Sally, I know I'm going to get in on the last day because I don't care if any of you are saved. I just want to know that you're behind me when I look over my shoulder at the resurrection. Because as Jesus says, if you're not first, you're last. Oh, wait, no, that's Ricky Bobby. Um, (laughs) This is the problem. For Luther, with Erasmus' whole scheme, the way he sets up our, our willing with the help of God's grace is it sets us up to become fatalists like Luther himself was in the monastery when he famously said later in life, I used to curse God. I used to damn God. I would pray to God through gritted teeth because I would beat my body, literally whip himself. He would fast. He would stand outside in the winter in the snow praying that God would repent him of the desires of his flesh. And as Luther says in his table talks, just when I thought I'd done enough, I would go to sleep and I would have erotic dreams. And I would wake up in the morning soiled. And I would cry out to God, I can't control my own dreams, so how am I supposed to purge myself of my sinful desires and wants? And he said, I despaired of myself and of God, because God is righteous and holy, and I am not. So unlike Erasmus, who thinks that the will is like a stick shift in a car that can be downshifted or upshifted, Luther says this is a fiction. This is an abstraction. Free will after the fall exists in name only. Instead, a person's will to be an actual will has to always be willing something. I said it simpler in the beginning. Your heart always wants something and your mind is always justifying what you want. That's what it means to have a will. Whether it's good or evil, doesn't matter. You're constantly wanting something. You're constantly choosing something. Even if it's thinking, even if it's breathing, you're constantly choosing to do something. Your mind is justifying why you're doing it. So that Ultimately, our disaffection with God, our lack of love and affection for God assumes choice and assumes neutrality. If you assume that you have the ability to obey God's commandments, in the end, for Luther, you'll hate God because you'll never be able to accomplish it perfectly. And so that's the error of assuming that you have a free will. Not that you have a will, not that you're being optimistic about the possibilities of each one of us in in our relationship with Jesus Christ, but that ultimately it leads to a complete breakdown of the individual Christian, and they despair of themselves, they despair of their salvation, and they don't turn to Christ. 
because he sits on a rainbow bridge with a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, waiting to cut you down and send you into hell. So Luther writes this. In this whole matter of the will, whether we have a will or we don't have a will in relation to God and our salvation, the key point, again, is not to ask the question, what is God doing? What is God thinking? What is the hidden will of God? What is God, his psychology? But rather this. The truth is as Christ puts it. He that is not with me is against me. He does not say he that is not with me is not against me either, but he's in a neutral position. Because if God is in us, then Satan is out of us. And then it is present with us to will only good. But if God is not in us, Satan is in us, and then it is present with us to will only evil, so that neither God or Satan permits there to be in us any willing in the abstract sense. But as you rightly said, Erasmus, we have lost our freedom and we are forced to serve sin until God's grace acts upon us, Erasmus' argument, that is, we will sin and evil, we speak sin and evil, and we do sin and evil. On God's own testimony, men are flesh and blood. They can savor, they can desire nothing but the flesh. Therefore, free will can only have a taste, have a desire for sin. And if, while the Spirit of God is calling and teaching among these people, that they go from bad to worse, what could they do when left to themselves without the Spirit of God? So Dr. Luther famously says then at the end of his argument that an unregenerate person, a non-Christian, one who is not a baptized child of God, when they hear the word of God, they go from bad to worse. They become even more rebellious when they hear the gospel, not less. On God's own testimony, Dr. Luther writes, men are flesh and blood. They can desire nothing but the flesh. So free will, as you call it, Erasmus, can desire only one thing, sin and death. This is why, Dr. Luther argues, Christ has to come under the form of the opposite. He has to come in the exact opposite way that you and I would expect or want him to come. That's why, as St. Paul points out in Corinthians, every time a Christian walks into the room, everybody lifts up their shoes and checks to see what they walked in. Because he smells of what? Death and the grave. What they don't know, though, is that they smell of death and the grave because he's been put to death and raised from the dead. All they smell is death. So when Jesus comes, he comes the opposite way that we might want or expect. This is the way it has to be. There's no way to get through to creatures who are bound up in sin by death other than sideways, indirectly. So that what Erasmus calls free will cannot stand God to be God for us. It can only desire the things of flesh and blood. So for Luther then, when Jesus comes close... We want nothing to do with him. And so we do, well, we do the exact same thing that everybody does when Jesus gets too close. We kill him. And if we can't kill him, we'll kill each other. Jesus always comes in the opposite of what we expect. So Luther writes, you who imagine the will as something standing in a neutral position left to its own devices, find it easy to imagine that there can be an act of the will in either direction, good or evil, because you think of both God and the devil as being a long way away, as if they're just watching us in our incorruptible or unchangeable free will. Because you do not believe, Erasmus, that they are the movers and the inciters of us enslaved will engaged in a bitter conflict with each other over the Christian, over the human. Because for either the kingdom of Satan in man means nothing, and then Christ must be a liar, or else if his kingdom is as Christ describes the devil's kingdom, free choice must be nothing but a captive beast of burden to Satan which can only be set free if the devil is first cast out by the finger of God. So Luther in his famous commentary on, uh, on Psalm 73 points this out, that we are ridden like a beast by either Christ or the devil, and we have no choice. But what we think, what Erasmus actually uses this example, is that we're like a horse that's standing in the stall in the morning says, this morning, you know what, I don't feel like going out. I'm going to stay in all day. And then the rider comes, he puts the saddle on, and he gets in the saddle, and the horse says, well... I changed my mind. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out today. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to canter. I'm not going to trot. So the rider takes the horse out of the barn and sets off at a full gallop, comes back into the barn. The horse is sweaty, lathered, muscles trembling. And the horse says, I wanted to do that the whole time. <laughs>
You see, Erasmus' problem with God is that God doesn't wait for sinners to work with him in their salvation. Instead, what he does is he comes in Christ to reconcile the world to himself before we have a chance to even make a choice. Side note, this is why Luther argues for infant baptism. Because left to our own devices to choose whether to be baptized or not, we'll ruin it every time. (laughs) For Luther then, it follows that God's God's work is exclusive to Jesus, Christ alone. Not Christ and us, not Christ with additions, not no buts or breaks, just Christ alone. That's how God works out our salvation. He does something for us by coming in Christ to reconcile the world to himself, and he doesn't ask for our permission. He doesn't ask for a public opinion poll. He doesn't give us a multiple choice form. He just says, here, this is my glory. And it smells of blood and piss and shit. That's grace. So Dr. Luther writes, Christ is said to be the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. And that is said categorically. That is, there's Christ and there's everything else. So that whatever is not Christ is not the way, but an error. It's not the truth, but a lie. It's not the life, but death. So it follows then of necessity that free will, since it is neither Christ nor is in Christ, is bound up in error, in untruth, and death. Just as I said at the beginning, what does God's wrath feel like? It feels like free will. Because what we call the will, Christ calls error, untruth, and death. And outside of himself, outside of Christ, there's nothing but Satan. There's nothing but God's wrath. Darkness, error, lies, and death. So therefore, one must conclude, Luther writes, every statement about Jesus Christ is a direct testimony against your free will in relation to God. Why? Why? Because in the one kingdom, Satan reigns, and he holds captive because of his will all that are not wrestled away from him by the Spirit of Christ. And nor does Satan allow them to be plucked away by any power other than the Spirit of God, just as Jesus Christ tells us in the parable of the strong man, armed, keeping his palace in peace. In the other kingdom, Christ rules. His kingdom continues to resist and war against the kingdom of Satan. And we are translated into Christ's kingdom, not by our own power, not by our own choosing, but by the grace of God, which delivers us from this present evil world and tears us away from the power of darkness. The knowledge, the confession of this reality, writes Luther, is repeated and confessed plainly enough by the common man in his Proverbs, prayers, efforts, and in his entire life. Luther points out that even pagans know we don't have free will. So Erasmus, why are you arguing for it? It's not human freedom, but God's freedom that's the problem for Erasmus. It's not human freedom that's Rasmus' problem. It's God's freedom. God elects sinners on account of Christ's work. That's the problem and that's the obstruction for Rasmus when it comes to our ability to will and choose to follow and obey God's law. God has taken our problem, bondage to sin and death. He's taken freedom and salvation apart from our choice. And for Rasmus, that means that God is neither loving or merciful. Because if we can't take responsibility for our own salvation even a little bit, how is that loving and merciful? How are we supposed to improve if we have no choice? How are we supposed to get better? That's why Erasmus goes behind the words of Scripture to find the hidden meaning, to make some ultimate claim about God and our ability to participate in our salvation. Luther, on the other hand, says that the gospel is meaningless outside of Christ and the cross. That the gospel doesn't mean anything. It just does what it says. You are forgiven doesn't mean anything because you are forgiven. It's like I use the example, if my wife comes out, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for this. <laughs> when my wife comes out of the bedroom and says, come in here and make wild monkey love to me, I don't ask her, what do you mean? <laughs> if I do, that's pretty much a sign that our marriage is in trouble. There are certain things that we say that are meaningless. They simply declare what is so that the gospel doesn't need a meaning attached to it. It's not an idea floating around waiting for you to define it, but rather the gospel does what it says because the gospel is Jesus Christ speaking to you directly. So when he says you are a baptized child of God, you just are. When he says this is my body given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin, this is his body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin, it just is. And when he absolves you, you just are, whether you like it or not. Because God speaks a concrete, real word in the present tense that Christ is God for you. That God is really God because he translates you through his word, revealing just who exactly he will be for you. 
So Luther writes, if we are taught and believe that we ought to be ignorant of the necessary knowledge of God and the necessity of all these events, and like Dr. Paulson said, all of creation is bent toward our salvation. That's what he means here. That God bends all of creation, even the devil and his angels are bent toward participating in our salvation. And that it's necessary that it happen this way. Then, Christian faith, utterly destroyed, the promises of God and the whole gospel fall to the ground completely if we go through Erasmus. Because the Christian's chief and only comfort in adversity, in struggle and affliction, lies in knowing that God doesn't lie, but instead he brings all things to pass unchangingly, and that his will cannot be resisted, it can't be altered, it can't be obstructed. And that is the hinge on which everything turns for Luther in his response to Erasmus. The knowledge and the confession that there are two kingdoms at war, the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of Christ. You can't reason this out for people. You can't make it seem logical by appealing to the free will. You can't appeal to moral responsibility. So let Luther says, frankly, I confess that for myself, even if it could be true, I don't want free will. I don't want free will given to me. Why? Because anything left in my own hands that is put on me to be responsible to uh, work out my own salvation, well, one, not just because of all the dangers I face every day, would I not want free will, not because of all the adversities and the attacks of the devils. I could not stand my ground and hold fast to my own free will because one devil is stronger than all of the men on earth combined. And on these terms, then nobody could be saved if they have a free will in regards to their salvation. But because even if there were no dangers, adversities, or devils, I should still be forced to work with no guarantee of my success. I would be beating my fist in the air. And even if I lived and worked to all eternity, my conscience would never never reach a comfortable certainty as to how much it would need to do to satisfy God. Whatever work I had done, there would be always this nagging doubt as to whether it pleased God or whether I had to do something more. But now that God has taken my salvation out of the control of my own choosing and put it under the control of his will, and he has promised to save me, not according to my work, not according to my running, but according to his own grace and mercy, I have the comfortable certainty that he is faithful and that he will not lie to me and that he is also great and he is powerful so that no devils, no opposition can break him or pluck him from me. And furthermore, he says, I have the comfortable certainty that I please God, not because of my merit, not because of my works, but because he is merciful and he has promised me favor. So that if I work too little or I work badly, he doesn't impute that to me, but with fatherly compassion, he pardons me and he makes me better. How does he make me better? He puts the old sinner in me to death and he raises up a new man in Christ every single day. We cannot have it both ways. He says, the grace of God cannot be made so cheap as to be obtainable anywhere and everywhere by any man's puny little effort. And at the same time, to make the grace of God so dear as to be given to us only in and through the grace of one man, a great man. And so Luther says, I wish that the defenders of free choice would take a warning at this point and realize that when they assert free will, they are denying Christ. And so you see what a vast difference this makes for Dr. Luther, for a preacher to stand in front of a congregation of people, sinners, and assume that their wills are bound in sin and death and that they cannot participate even a hair's breadth in their own salvation. And so that the preacher is sent by God to set them free from their captivity to their own willing. The difference is as great as that between God's work through the Holy Spirit and the work of Satan. But then again, how many have been willing to say what Luther says about having a God who is preached or a God who is not preached? And so for that reason, I would argue anyways, that Luther's bondage of the will operates as a kind of litmus test for what a person is going to be or become theologically and as a preacher and as a pastor. If you want to know who you are as a theologian, who you're going to become as a theologian or a preacher or a pastor, read the bondage of the will. And that'll lay it out because you'll either throw it in the corner and never pick it up again, disgusted by his argument, or you'll read it for the next 18 years and never put it down again. Because at Christ, what we call free will meets its end. And yet that is exactly where the beginning of faith occurs. When the will of you and me is put to death by the law, then faith begins. Faith in Christ alone. 
That's why at its heart, the bondage of the will is Luther at his best. It's Luther at his most Lutheran. That's Luther insisting that in the face of Erasmus' attack on the gospel, under the mask of grace and freedom, under the disguise of being able to obey God's holy will and law, Luther insists that in the face of Erasmus' attacks, for the sake of all of that, Christ must be preached in Christ alone. That's what Luther stood on. That's what Luther was willing to be excommunicated for. That's what Luther was willing to be put to death for. And that's why he stood before popes and princes and before the world and said, Christ must be preached and Christ alone. That's why we stand here today with Luther and the reformers because we're here and you're sitting there at home watching this because we insist Christ must be preached and Christ alone without additions, with no buts or breaks, unconditionally, Christ alone is our salvation and that we live our entire life bound up in sin and death because we are in the flesh. And yet in spite of that, God has chosen to favor you and to say to you in the present tense, baptism now saves you. And now, and now, and every now until the resurrection. And that the blood of Christ covers your sin, not just today, but every day and always. Because you are a baptized child of God. And he sends you a preacher to say, put away all that free will bullshit. That turns you away from the cross. It turns you away from salvation. And instead, hear the words of the preacher I have sent to you, that as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority and command, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.